I wanted to talk a little bit about Shavuot and what Shavuot is. Uh, Shavuot is one of the seven feasts of the Lord, and it is known as Pentecost in the Gentile community. And uh, I wanted to show you the pattern of this feast and uh, what it's all about. Um, I'm going to be reading to you from uh, the book that I absolutely love, um, Sharing the Feasts. And um, it's this book. Here's how you say, uh, great is the Lord, happy Shavuot. You say, Gadol Adonai Hag Sameach Shavuot. Um, there are several scriptures that are read during this time. One of them is Psalm 133, and it speaks about the unity of God's people. And keep that in mind, because we're going to see how this feast of Shavuot is all about unification. And um, it's about brothers coming together. So these are some of the themes of this feast. It's usually celebrated uh, with sweets and decorating with flowers. Um, you'll see people eating fresh fruit and cheesecake and um, linces and fun sweets like that. But here's the book that I wanted to read from today. It's called The Feasts of the Lord. And there's multiple books out there, but this one I really love because it has incredible pictures in it. And it is um, fun to read. It, it really gives you a view of this feast from a perspective as if you were there. I wanted to show you one of the pictures in the book. This is um, the temple where Peter came out and spoke after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And I wanna read you from this book. Um, what went on on this day, which we read about in the first chapter of Acts. So let me just read this to you before we start today. In the stillness of the mid-morning air, the temple morning service could be heard as it concluded. The blast of the silver trumpets, the thunder of worshipers praying in unison, the solitary voice of the reader chanting from Ezekiel and Habakkuk, Throngs of Jewish worshipers crowded the temple courts. Suddenly, from overhead, a roar of a violent windstorm was heard. But how could this be? There's no clouds, there's no breeze. It was the wrong time of the year for a storm. The worshipers stood confused, searching the sky. The sound began to change as if it were descending toward the west. Several hundred men in the outer court rushed out the southwest gate past the temple guards and onto the towering steps leading down to the city below. And that's the picture I just showed you. The crowd pushed onward, determined to know what was going on. In a few moments, they reached the house and were pounding on the door. Had not 12 men from inside pushed their way to the street, the door surely would have been broken down. The 12 immediately began to address a barrage of excited queries from the crowd. This caused an uproar of discussion. Words of wind and fire had spread quickly to the teeming crowds who were now leading the temple service. One of the 12 named Peter, apparently the spokesman, shouted for the crowd to follow him to the nearby plaza outside the southern entrance. And that's the picture you're looking at there. And then he began to speak and he said, men of Judea and all in Jerusalem, let me explain. These men aren't drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Well, then the same thing that had just been read in this, the temple, which was from the book of Ezekiel with a loud noise and a roaring wind and fire, etc., was now happening right in front of them uh, over the 12 that were in the upper room praying. So um, this is a, an amazing time because what was going on on this feast the Feast of Shavuot was now happening again, uh, literally, where before they were celebrating it as the day that the uh, Ten Commandments were given. Now, in the New Testament, we're seeing that this is the exact same day that the Holy Spirit was poured out. 
So look at these words here for this, the, the title Shavuot. I wanted to show you, because you're my Hebrew students, how these words all share similar uh, letters. Shavuot comes from the verb or the root word Sheba, which means seven. It also means an oath, and it means to satisfy. So think of, think of what's happening when, when the Ten Commandments were, were given on Shavuot. It, it also means something that satisfies, or it's like a promise being given. And we've talked about this in the past, how it's considered uh, Israel's wedding day, when God would marry Israel as a bride. Well, the word Shavuot has the word oath sharing the same meaning and also to be complete and to be satisfied. It's also the word for dwell, yeshav. And so God is about to dwell with mankind in the form of his written word, the Ten Commandments. And then again in the New Testament, he's about to dwell with his people in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so that's the beauty of this day. Um, it's also a day when they read from the book of Ruth or Ruth in Hebrew. Uh, and they read it in the synagogues uh, because Ruth's loyalty to her mother-in-law was also symbolic of Israel's loyalty to Adonai, her, her God. And also, it's a time that a uh, story was of the barley harvest when Boaz uh, let Ruth glean from the um, barley field. And so Ruth's great-grandmother uh, she was a great grandmother also of David, and David is in tradition thought to have been born on Shavuot, and also he died on Shavuot. So those are some interesting facts around this holiday. It begins at sundown on Thursday and celebrated all day Friday. Um, Hosea is also read, uh, and it talks about a future time when the children of Israel would come under one head, and it's called the day of Jezreel. What's amazing about that, in the word Jezreel means God's seed. So um, it's a time of assembling under one head. Now think about that. When the, when the Torah was poured out and given as the Ten Commandments, it's God is uniting his people with his word. And then fast forward to the New Testament, God is uniting once again under one head, his people through the power of the Holy Spirit being poured out on that exact same day. That's the um, comforter that Jesus said to wait for. So there's so many connections and you could go on and on about this uh, holiday. Harvey, is there anything you would like to add? I'm sure you could add to this some enrichment. Well, you did a beautiful job, and uh, this is an important holiday in Judaism. It, uh, it is one of the three pilgrimage festivals, and every adult male is required to be in Jerusalem uh, during the holiday of Shavuot. Um, as you said, this was originally an agricultural holiday, but uh, it came to be known in Judaism uh, traditionally as the day that uh, the children of Israel uh, who left Egypt uh, 49 days prior come to Mount Sinai and God gives them the law. You may also remember that uh, because of the sin of the golden calf, 3,000 Jews were killed as a result of their sin at Mount Sinai. And isn't it interesting that on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, we learn that 3,000 Jews come to the Lord on the same day, yeah. celebrating the same feast. So I'll let you draw your own conclusions yeah. based on that. But 3,000 awesome. lost and 3,000 saved. Awesome, awesome, awesome. It's, it's validation of um, 
what God was doing that day. I also wanted to show you the um, pattern here. I think it's fun to look at this. Um, here's the foot feast or the regalim that Harvey was talking about, Passover, Shavuot, and uh, Sukkot. So here's the 49 days from the second day of Passover, and you count 49 days. So the 50th day is Shavuot. And what's interesting on this day is also it's the day, the fourth day of creation, where all the luminaries were created, the sun, the moon, and the stars. And so Jesus, as the light of the world, um, to me, this is just like so profound that if, if you follow the days of creation along with this pattern, that this is when the light of the world was created. So all these things just keep pointing to the Messiah over and over again. And traditionally, also the Jews stay up all night and study Torah on this, on this night of Shavuot. And um, it's... Uh, pretty exciting time. I want to get out of here a minute and just show you a real brief uh, video. Uh, I looked up the, this holiday in Israel and there's this awesome two minute video I want to show you. For those of you who haven't been to Israel, I'm going to come out of this and then share my screen and show you this video. It's just fun to see all the people um, streaming into uh, the plaza and going to the um, the Western Wall. So I'm going to just show you this real quick, so you can watch it. to show you that I know uh, Harvey and all of us were there standing in that exact place and it was pretty exciting wasn't it so when I saw that on the internet I was like oh I was right there that's so exciting all right so that's what's going on in the world of Judaism right now they're preparing for that special time and uh, let me go back to my PowerPoint and we will continue our lesson for the day let me go up. I also wanted to show you one other quick fun thing just uh, that I share in some of my classes that when you look at the pattern of the seven branch menorah, you know how they have the almonds on here in the original description of this uh, menorah? The word for almond in Hebrew is shechad or sheched. comes from the verb shechad. And it means to urge forward, to be steadfast, and to strive. And there's 22 almond blossoms, the exact same number as the letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And I just think that's fun. Why did he pick 22? I mean, he could have picked eight. He could have picked 10. But 22 almonds, as if it's symbolic of... Um, a blossoming forth as we study Torah. And then look at the almond trees are the first to blossom in Israel. 
So there's so many symbolic things in Judaism that I just find fascinating and amazing. If you want to go to this website on your own and just read about the almonds in Israel, it's pretty exciting. Uh, and it's also the, the, the rod of uh, Moses that uh, budded. And it's, it was put in the Ark of the Covenant, along with the Ten Commandments and the jar of manna. So anyway, that's just some more fun stuff. Here's that word shechad translated in the New Testament. Remember I said it means to be solid, to, to stick with it. Um, so here in Acts 2, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching. And that's the word shechad. And then also in 1 Corinthians, to those who by patience or endurance steadfastness, it's another translation of that word. And then in 1 Corinthians, shakad is translated as watch or to give careful attention to. So I just find those kind of connections, to me, they're meaningful because I'll read that or I'll see, oh my goodness, look at how that connects to the New Testament and how it shows up on the menorah in the temple. So anyway, that's just uh, some fun stuff to think about. So let's start our letters today. We're going to study the letter Kof. And Kof uh, looks kind of like a P, doesn't it? The way I remember to write this one, let me show you, get my little writing utensil. I think about um, this being an upside down foot and he's kicking a football. And I think of the word kick as a K sound, but it's a Q. So when I see this, I think of him quickly kicking and I'll think of Q, quick. I know that's silly, but uh, it may be helpful to you. And think of kicking quickly and you'll say, oh, that's the koof. So let's look at some fun words that start with koof. And I'll try to increase this. I, I was smart enough today to add some talcum powder so that I can actually increase this. Is it gonna work? Oh no, now it's too slippery. Okay, um, this kof is um, in its ancient form, the back of a head. And so here we go. Um, kof shows up in some fun Hebrew words. Uh, the word call is the word kara in Hebrew. And kara means to meet or to gather in a community. And if you put a mem on the front, you get a mikra, or a calling together, or a holy convocation. So a Hebrew word that you'll hear often is a mikra, or a calling together. It's also the beginning of the word for kol, for the voice of God. And it also means thunder, or expressing something that's loud. And that's why in scripture, you're, you'll hear them say, oh, that was God speaking, the voice of God. And others would say, no, it's thunder. Well, it's this word, coal. Uh, one you'll all be very familiar with is the word holy, or to sanctify, or set apart. And it's the word kadosh. And uh, it means also in its verb form, this is what I love about being set aside by God to be used by him. It means to prepare for a task, to invite or summon. So I think that's beautiful when God says, here's how, you, here's how you're holy. When I fill you with my Holy Spirit and you believe in Yeshua and you want to follow him, that whole process means an invitation to prepare for a task. So you, you see a, a fuller meaning when you look up those words in your beautiful etymological book because you'll get these full meanings and you'll say, oh my gosh, when, when the Lord makes me holy, he's preparing me for a task. That's where that word comes from. So that's why I love looking at these words. And then look at this word, church. It comes from the Hebrew word kahal, 
Kof he lamed. And look what it means in its verb form. Church, to congregate, to gather, to implement a plan. That's in its verb form. So when you go to church, you're gathering to implement God's plan. God's plan for us. So as the Holy Spirit speaks to us when we gather together, it's so that God can say what his desire and plan is for us. And can you think about in the New Testament where it says, don't um, neglect the calling of people together. Don't neglect the kahal. And so anytime in the Old Testament, there was a gathering of believers, it was the church. <laughs> this word kahal shows up all over the Old Testament. So the church didn't literally begin in the New Testament, even though... Yes, we know the Holy Spirit was poured out, but really the church began way before that, in that wherever God's people gathered, congregated, it's this word, kahal, and you'll see it in the Old Testament everywhere. It's the word ecclesia in Greek. And so uh, when people say the church began in the New Testament in grace and all that, I go, oh no, 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 grace the church, all of that began whenever God's people believed and gathered together. So literally, in Hebrew, that's the word kahal. And look at the word also kadam. It means east. And um, it also means ancient. So um, you'll see this word show up in some of the, I don't know if you ever watch Netflix, but <laughs> I've noticed that there's a lot of people named Kedem um, or Kedem in some of those um, Iranian and Arabic movies. And it means ancient or Eastern from the East. Look at the word Kana, zeal in Hebrew. What I love about, this is one of my favorite words that I put in my book for favorite Hebrew words, kana. It means zeal, but it also means jealous in Hebrew. So look at what kana or zeal means in Hebrew. It is not bad to be jealous. Envy or jealousy is wrong when you want something that's not rightfully yours. So when it says God is jealous for us, it's this word, kana. And it means to be jealous or zealous for what's rightfully yours. So this is why when you see that word jealous in Hebrew, realize that it's, it's to want what's rightfully yours. It's the same word for zealous. So when you're zealous for God and jealous for him, it's good because he's rightfully mine and vice versa. I love that word. And I love that it means both jealous and zealous. And another one of my favorite words is to hope. And it's the word kava. Kof, vav, he. Look what it means in its um, verb form. I love this. To purposely gather to act, strive to a goal, hope, and plumb line. Oh my goodness, think about that. Hope is also the word for a plumb line. A plumb line is dropped to show you what is right. Have you ever wallpapered a room and not done a plumb line. <laughs> and by the time you get to the end of the end wall, your wallpaper looks like this because you didn't start with what was right. So when we start with Jesus and our hope is in him, we're starting with the right plumb line. Do you see how beautiful that is? These words are all connected and give you spiritual insight as you learn their full meaning. So, Rahab, remember when she put out the red rope? It was her hope. And it was like a plumb line dropped out her window. Um, it's the word for kava, hope. 
same word for plumb line, same word for mikvah. You add an M, mem, before the word kava, and you get a mikvah, the word for hope. So when you get a mikvah and you're cleansed, it's the place of hope. Can you see that? So, and it shows up first in Genesis 1. That's why I love to go to Blue Letter Bible. If you look up this word, kava, in your Blue Letter Bible, then scroll down and it'll show you where it first appears. It first appears where it says, God gathered kava, the waters, into one place. So it was like that word was in the beginning when God gathered the waters into one place. Why did he gather the waters? So that dry land could appear and then fruitfulness could come forth. So it, it's just, it goes on and on as you look at these words and, and really meditate on them and say, oh my gosh, there's another connection. It showed up in the very beginning, that word hope. Wow. That's why I love Hebrew. So let's go on to our next letter, letter Resh. And this one, in its ancient form, was the back of a head. Oops, come back here. And the way I remember Resh, let me get my little drawing tool. I remember Resh because when I draw it, it's the really, really rounded letter. So when I see this rounded corner, it looks a lot like Dalit, doesn't it? It's very easy to confuse a resh that's rounded here over a Dalit. But remember, Dalit has the dingle dangle. And resh is really rounded on that corner. So when I see it, I look over at the corner and I go, is that a Dalit or a Resh? I go, oh no, it's really round. And I think of R for Resh. Does that make sense? I hope so. So let me clear that. Resh or Rosh means head. It's, it's used in words that show up having something to do with the highest, the first, the head of something, a chief, the top, a summit, um, you'll notice that you'll see the word rush in these words. And so let's look at a few of those and see for yourself. Let me get rid of my little tool here. And let's go look at some of the words in rush. It's called a liquid in its linguistic form. And the reason is, is because the letter R and L in Hebrew are very similar. And you see this also in the Chinese language. That's why you'll hear them say like flied lice instead of fried rice. And they joke about the Chinese. They can't say their L's and R's. Well, it's because they're both liquid letters and it, and it spills over into the Chinese language. Um, so let's look at some words here. The first one is ruach, spirit, and it's resh. What vowel is this with the dot in the belly? You. And then remember when we said when we see chet at the end of a word with the um, katak under it, we say the vowel first and then the letter. So it's ruach. And that's spirit. And it's also the word for wind, power, invisible strength to force an open space. Think about that. This word in its verb form means to force open space. Now think about it. <laughs> the reach, the same word reach, is the word for a fragrance because fragrance is carried in an open space in the wind or in the air so ruach is spirit or wind 
And it's also reach, meaning a fragrance. So if we're filled with the Holy Spirit, shouldn't we have the fragrance of Christ? See, it comes from the same root word. And then you see those connections yourself and you go, oh my goodness, Lord. It's an invisible strength that opens me up to the things of God. <laughs> I love that word. Put it in your book. And look at the word for head, which is rosh, resh. This is the O vowel and the shin. If you add the letter noon to the end of this, you get the ordinal number for first or reshon. And that's the um, order, first, second, third. Cardinal is one, two, three. Uh, ordinal is first, second, third place. So that's the word reshon. Look at the word for shepherd, roe. The Lord is my shepherd. And what I love about this, if you look at this in its ancient symbols, it's what comes from the one you see first. If this means first and ion means an eye, this means behold. I can look at this and think to myself, wow, behold, the one I see first. Isn't that what a shepherd is to its sheep? <laughs> he is the good shepherd, the one I see first when I follow him. Anyway. Those are just fun things to think about when you're studying Hebrew. Uh, look at the word to see, ra'ah, resh, aleph, hey, ra'ah, to see or to observe. This ancient word picture, if I looked at it, could mean what comes from the strongest that I see first, the strongest first. To me, that would be the one I see right in front of me. Seeing is considered, in Hebrew, the rabbi saying sight is considered our greatest strength. To see is to have personal knowledge or to understand something. We say seeing is believing. Well, in, in Christianity, we could say believing is then seeing. So, um, I see, I understand. That's usually why we say, oh, I see, I understand. And then look, the Torah calls the sun and the moon two witnesses because we see them continually night and day. So to see something, um, I love that word. It means I have a personal knowledge. So every time I see the sun and the moon, at night when the moon comes up, I go, oh, one of the witnesses. And then I see the sun, I go, oh, the other witness. And that's why I love to stand on my patio in the morning and just watch the sunrise and say, oh Lord, you are the first witness of the day as you rise. And then one morning I was standing out there and I heard all the birds singing and I went, oh, worship service. The birds are worshiping as the sun rises. It's like, the Son of God standing up and everybody worshiping. I love that. That's just me being me. Look at this word, wicked. Resh, ayan, ayan. It's the word ra'ah in Hebrew. Do you know the word for wicked in Hebrew is the same word for to be broken? It's the word to break to pieces in its verb form. So when you think about somebody who's broken, when, when the uh, scripture says, let the wicked forsake his ways, really, if you think about it, it's something that's broken. And I know I've shared this in the past with you in other places, but uh, when I'm witnessing to somebody, um, I remember once I was witnessing to a, uh, a realtor. He was next door to me and he was um, gay. And I said to him, do you feel like Christians judge you for being gay? He said, yes. I said, do you know what that word is in Hebrew? And he said, no. I said, it's the word ra'ah, to be broken. I said, do you know what? I said, I'm broken and you're broken. We're all broken. 
And the next thing you know, I'm sharing the gospel with him because I used this word ra'ah to relate to him so that he could then relate to me, that I wasn't judging him based on his um, orientation sexually, but that we were all equal at the foot of the cross. And so I love how Hebrew allows me to use those words in different situations. Um, I've used them with people's tattoos. <laughs> At the gym yesterday, I just saw the guy from my gym with all his tattoos. I told him what one of his tattoos meant in Hebrew. And it started a whole conversation with this guy. He's a, a, a welder, very tough looking, muscular guy with, with uh, tattoos everywhere. Yet the Lord allowed me to use his tattoos using a Hebrew word. And before you know it, I, he's sharing his, pouring his heart out to me and he's crying in the middle of the gym. And it all started from using a Hebrew word with this man and his tattoos. So I love how God uses us as we diligently seek him and even words in his language to use in evangelism. And when I end today, I want to share a fun story to you with you also about how the Lord has used this in my life with uh, Hebrew words. Look at this word. This is another one of my favorites. And then we're going to take a break. Um, the word for mercy is racham. Resh, chet, mem, sofit, or final mem. Racham means mercy. But look what else it means. To protect from harm. Mm -hmm. to empathize, and it means maternal compassion. Now, in my study, I also came across the word womb in Hebrew, and it's this word right here. Although it's got different vowels, the word for womb in Hebrew is rechem, resh, and it's got an E under it and an E under the het. So the word for mercy the place where you protect from harm is the same word for a woman's womb. Think about that. When God gives you a child, it's an act of mercy. It's so beautiful. And when you think of the, the people that are wanting to abort babies, that are this beautiful, protected child made in God's image in a woman's womb. And it means the place of God's compassion. Wow, you can't help it. This is another way that you can speak to people. Perhaps, uh, for example, I'll just tell you a real quick story that just flew into my head. When I was trying to get pregnant, uh, I was hooked up with a little girl who was pregnant, and I told her I would take her baby. And I was explaining to her what it meant uh, to have compassion. I wish I had known this word then uh, to share with her, um, but I couldn't convince her, and she aborted her baby. And it just made me weep for days afterwards that this beautiful thing that God had done in her life, had she allowed God to fulfill that, uh, I have two of those babies now, and they're 28 and 35 years old. And um, if you know some young girl who's pregnant, this would be an awesome word to share with her. I wish I had known that word then. I called her at midnight and begged her not to abort her baby, that I would take it, I would pay for it, I would do anything. And uh, the next day she went up to LA and got an abortion. So this is another one of those words that um, put it in your book because you never know when God is gonna use you in someone's life to share this beautiful picture of uh, God's blessing that comes um, when we do things God's way. So I'm gonna now jump out of the screen and we can open up, um, we'll take five minute break, and we can open up, unmute everybody. If anybody has any comments or questions, go ahead and unmute yourself if you have any thoughts. 
I'm just going to sit here because I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> I have some questions regarding um, the two silent vowels, uh, Aleph and Ayan. And yes. when you use them, because I see, you know, they're in the middle of the word or the beginning of the word. Is there a particular rule that I need to know about them? Unfortunately, there really, <laughs> there really isn't. There, you just have to learn, you, get your vocabulary down. And in the end of today's lessons, I'm going to show you how to build a good vocabulary. And you'll just learn where these show up. You'll, you'll learn what words start with an aleph and which ones start with an ayin. And it just really comes with knowing the Hebrew and, and getting a good foundation of words. Uh, other than that, uh, you don't know how to pronounce them until you put a vowel point under them right. or over them or in them. <laughs> so that's and that. When, and then when do you use the, the sofit uh, for cough and noon? They almost look identical at the they end. They do of the almost word. look identical. Um, the cough um, is used and these, all the sofits are only used when they're at the end of a word. So again, you just have to learn and learn to recognize the difference. The difference between the cough so feet and the noon so feet is that top part. The noon is very short at the top with a long tail. And then the cough it has a longer top and then the same long tail. You just, the more you, you look at words, the more it'll become clear to you which is which. But they do look alike. They're very similar. See the, um, the alphabet song, it says um, kof and kof. Uh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> and then it you'll also different, says, You'll do, hear different pronunciations okay. of it. Kof, uh, kof. It's spelled K-U-F sometimes, mm -hmm. Q-O-F. It really just depends on who's um, saying it and who's spelling it. It's different groups spell it different. Do you have any comments, Harvey? I see you smiling. <laughs> How do the Ashkenazis pronounce it? Kuf. Kuf. Yeah. Huh. yeah. And the same thing um, at the, we haven't covered this letter yet, but Shin in the song, it says uh, Shin Sin. We're going to cover that today. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> I have a fun way to remember that one that I just learned this last week. Um, and I'll share it with everybody when we get to that letter. So, Aleph, Bet, Bet, Aleph, Bet, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, Bob, Zion, Het, Tet, Bob, Zion, Het, Tet, Yod, Kaf, Kaf, Yod, Kaf, Kaf, Lamed, Mem, Noon, Lamed, Mem, Noon, Lamed, Lion, Pei, Fei, Sadi Kufresh, Let's sing it again. Let's sing it again. I'll start and then you repeat it, okay? Aleph, bet, bet. Gimel, dalet, hey. Bav Zion het tet. Yod kaf kaf. Yod kaf kaf. Lamed mehem noon. Lamed mehem noon. Samagayan pei fei. Samagayan pei fei. Sadi ku fresh. Sadi ku fresh. Shin. Sin ta. Sin ta. It is helpful to learn that little silly song. I can't tell you how many times I sang it as I was learning my Hebrew. So, um, yeah, it's a good little song. There's lots of songs, but anyway. Any other comments or questions before we move on? All righty. Well, let's mute everybody then. Everybody mute yourselves and I'll get back to uh, sharing my screen. And we will continue. Let me get out of that. Let's see.
where am I? Here we are. Okay. I wanted to show you that book, uh, in the book, this word racham, compassion, to show maternal mercy. And here's the word womb over here. And it also means a captive woman and a protective bird. Isn't that interesting? And then what I love about this uh, etymological dictionary is then you can go to these scriptures yourself and look them up in your blue letter Bible. And that's how I learn my words. And that's how I, uh, you nail down your vocabulary once you start studying. And then you'll start noticing things like this. Look at these, how they share the same first two letters. Rachel, that means Rachel. Racham, protect from harm. Rachaf, to flutter. This is what happened in the very beginning. See Genesis 1-2 where it says the Spirit of God was hovering over the, the waters. It's this word, Rachaf. And look, it's, it's the word Ruach. It's the word for Holy Spirit. So you see in all these words, the word for Holy Spirit. And then look, to wash thoroughly, Rachatz. So you see the word for ruach in all these words, and then you say to yourself, huh, how are these verbs similar? And how do they all go together? And so you'll have fun just looking at this yourself, and sometimes the Holy Spirit will just take you somewhere else in the scripture, and then you'll see a connection, like filling in the dots in those little books that we used to get when we were kids. Um, it's just a start noticing this when you look up words, similarities where they share two of the same letters. I find it fascinating. Um, and then here's the word broken, ra'ah, I just wanted to show you, to be broken into pieces. And what I noticed also on here is, look, it means first, and then it means two, it has two symbols for two, two eyes, what you see. And that reminded me of Eve in the garden, and I thought, oh, what did she do when she saw that the fruit was good for eating? <laughs> and it's the same word with two eyes and a head. And it's the word for Eve saw that it was good and she ate of it. So I thought of that as I was learning this word. I thought, oh, isn't this interesting? It's got two eyes. And then that's what Eve did when she saw that it was good. And she did the first act of wickedness. Anyway, that's just fun stuff that I do. Uh, I said, take a break, we already did that. Okay, so here's the letter, Shin and Sin. The way you remember which is which is the one with the dot on the right. Here's how you remember that. She is always right. <laughs> Get it? So when you see the dot on the right, she, it's the SH sound. When it's on the left, it's just plain S. So that's how you know shin from sin. Another fun way that I remember this is when this is a cargo ship, and this is a ship, sh sound when the car goes on the right but if the ship tilts it's gonna sink and it shifts over to the left so cargo ship on the right and then she sinks if he tips left so that's how i used to teach that but i like she's always right better <laughs> okay right harvey no comments okay you're our token male in our class. Ha, ha, ha. All right. So the word sheen, shin, in Hebrew actually means teeth. It also means ivory. Isn't that interesting? And so words that have to do with uh, consuming, in its ancient form, it looked like two front teeth. And that's where you get the word tooth or teeth from shin. This was the ancient uh, figure and it means to consume or eat. 
So it'll show up in words that have something to do with pressing or consuming or chewing or repeating even. Some of the, the mystical rabbis will say, it's in the word shana because two front teeth, you're repeating the exact same thing. See, two teeth, they look exactly the same, they repeat. So they, they will say in Kabbalah, it's something that repeats itself. And so if you look up some of the words yourself, you'll start seeing that. Now watch. Shalom, to be consumed by the peace of God. Shin, Lamed, this is your O, and this is your Mem. This should have been a Mem Sapit, but I just put the letters in there so you could look at them. I don't always do all the vowel pointing. I'm sorry. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But uh, anyway, um, seek peace. Here's the Hebrew for to seek peace and pursue it. It's Bachash, and that's the Kof that we learned previously. And so, Bechash Shalom means to seek peace, pursue peace. Uh, and it's not a passive state of being, it's an action. So, uh, we seek peace when we, um, why did I have cover in garment? I don't remember why I put that there. Oh, I know. Yeah, the word Salom means a covering or garment. See, it, it shares the same letters, but it's a, a sin instead of a shin. So salom means to cover with a garment. So isn't that beautiful that peace, I've got peace. It, it's like a covering or when the Lord covers you with his grace and his peace. It's the same word, salom, garment or a covering. Isn't that beautiful? That's another good word. Uh, when somebody's upset and you're saying, you know, let's just pray for God's peace to cover you. Do you know that's the same word in Hebrew? To cover means peace. So these are words that you can use when you're sharing with people who need peace. That's another good word to put in your golden nugget book. I have, let's see, I have a whole cabinet of books that are my favorite. And... This is what mine looks like. It says, do what makes you happy. And I put all my Hebrew words. Can you see them? All of my favorite words in here. And it's, it's just full of all those kind of words that just bless me and make me happy. So I hope you will have your own book. Somebody else gave me this one. Born to Sparkle. And I've been starting a new book with my Sparkle book. But anyway, um, Get a book and, and when these words bless you and you're studying, you know, write them in your book and the Lord will use you uh, if you are diligent. Look at the word for Sabbath or Shabbat. Starts with a shin, bet, tav. We're going to learn the tav today. And it means rest. And so the greeting on the Sabbath is Shabbat. And you say Shabbat Shalom, peaceful Sabbath. So see, now you can write that, can't you? Shin, Lamed, the, the vowel, O, Mem, and then Sabbath, Shin, Bet, Tav. Look at the word to hear, Shema, Shin, Mem, Ayan. Shema means hear, but it also means obey. So when you hear, God expects you then to walk it out. So hearing from him, walk it out. Obedience, same word, Shema. Look at the word for name, Shem. Um, the Jewish people call God's name, Hashem, the name. So you just put a hey here in front and you have Hashem. Look at the word, I love this one. This is another book, uh, word I put in my book. To keep the Sabbath or keep the Ten Commandments or keep anything is the word shamar. Shamar means also to guard, protect, or watch over. So if someone says, well, do you keep the Ten Commandments or do you keep the law? I say, yes, I guard and protect God's word. And that's what it means to guard or protect 
um, I, I said this, I think, before when we were learning the letter mem, um, that to keep something, you guard it, like a gatekeeper keeps the gate of the city, or a housekeeper protects your home by keeping it clean. So that has several meanings. So when they say, keep my commandments, that means guard and protect them. Watch over God's word. Follow it, guard it, protect it, support it, stand for it, especially today. So, and then look at the word shana. Here it is, to repeat. So it, you find it in a, a word meaning to repeat. So shana tova is the greeting on Rosh Hashanah. Shana means the first of the year. Rosh is first, right? You just learned the Resh first, and then Shana. So the first of the year, the greeting is Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah, see that? It means to repeat, double, change, and look at this. It shares the root with scarlet, sheni. They share two of the same letters. Now, though your sins be as scarlet, I can change that. Don't you love it? I saw that and I went, oh! Shana means to repeat something over and over and over. And it's the word scarlet? And right away my head went to something that I repeat is my sin, but when he changes them from scarlet to white, that's my forever standing. And that's where my head went when I learned the word Shani, Shana, is I go, oh, now these two share. How, how does that apply in any way? And sometimes the spirit will speak to you and, and tell you something very personal as you look at words like that. So I'm going to move on. We got one more letter. Uh, I wanted to show you also the shin shows up on the mezuzahs on the doorpost. Um, you may want to put one on your door. And they call it the guardian of the door of Israel. And look at the, the, word, the phrase guardian of the doors of Israel. Here's the word. Shomer, which means to guard. You just learned that. Remember? Keep. Shamar, guard, shomer, keep the dalit. Here it is. Remember you learned the letter dalit, and I said dalit means door. Here it is, dalit. So guard the doors of Yerushalayim or Israel. Yisrael. See that? So Look at the beginning letters. Shamar has a shin, the second word, dalit. Third word for Yisrael is a yod. You put those three together and it's Shaddai, El Shaddai. So the guardian of my door, they put the shin on it because of this phrase, guardian of the door of Israel. So that's what you'll see on many uh, mezuzahs on the doorpost. Okay, last letter, Tav. Its ancient letter is a cross, pair of cross sticks. And many of us know what that looks like, right? Um, the way I remember this, it's very simple. Um, I draw it. And I think it looks just like Chet, doesn't it? Except it has a tail. So that's how I remember the letter Tav versus just the letter Chet when I see it in a word, is that this one has a tail. And so I think of the T for Tav. And that's how I remember that letter. So a tav literally means, remember I said it's the name of the letter, but it's also a word. Tav means a sign, a mark, or a covenant. So when you see that letter, you're going to think of things that have to do with sign, mark, or covenant. Let's look at some of those words. Let me get rid of my little pointy here. 
and go to the top. Okay. Um, hold on, I'll get rid of my scribble. Okay. So let's look at some of the words. This is a word you'll probably never ever see. I, um, I, I learned this word when I was studying with another person. Remember I said I went through the whole six chapters of Genesis without knowing one word of Hebrew. I did it with a, a man named Brad Scott and he pointed this out when he got to the word Tav. <laughs> a guard room in Hebrew is the word Ta. And it's the Hebrew word for a cell or a chamber. And think about that. In the body, a cell contains all the information. Our DNA is a cell that's like a guard room in our body that contains all the information about us. And I thought, isn't that interesting that it's the same word for a guard room or a cell in Hebrew is the word ta. Um, and then if I said, oh my gosh, it's the same two letters as the Aleph Tav, except backwards. You see that? And it's almost like in our cell is everything we need from beginning to end. And remember where it says his word holds all things together? And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's the word for cell in our body? Oh my goodness. Okay, so that's just fun ways to look at letters and see all these little connections. Look at the word for ark, teva. Uh, Noah's ark, um, this is a thing that I should have gotten rid of. Okay, Noah's ark is called a teva, and also the basket that they put Moses in, in Hebrew is this word, teva, or an ark. So God was saving the world through Noah's teva, and then saved the Jewish nation, through the basket, the same word, teva. Uh, look at the word for perfect, ta'am. And in there is you got the word for people. Am is people. And I looked at that and I went, oh, covenant people. Perfect. <laughs> so this is what I, I do when I look at these words and I go, I notice other words within a word and I go, oh, look. The word for perfect has the word am, um, people of God, and they're covenant people, and it's the word to am. Um. Oh, I get it. Look for teaching, Torah. It means instruction. So when people say, oh, you know, the laws, we're done with the law, you know, we're now under grace, I go, no, 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 no. The Torah means teaching, instruction. We're still under God's teaching and instruction. We just realize now who it is that we follow, the living Torah. And so uh, God's law is holy, righteous, and good, and it still is with us today, holy, righteous, and good. It comes from this word, yavra, which means to point the right direction. It also means to cast forth. So when you're pointing, see, you're casting forth your hand and pointing. And it's the word for casting forth rain. And you hear that scripture in your head, my word falls like rain. See, casting forth his word from the mountaintop. It's the word for casting forth rain. That's where his word came from, Mount Sinai. You see how beautiful this language is? It's just like you, you just sit there and go, oh, where have I been all my life reading his word without knowing Hebrew. No wonder Billy Graham said that. So uh, those are our letters. And let me just show you what, what they do in the Hebrew culture. When you finish your letters, this is what I do when I have you in a class setting. The last day of class, when everybody learns all their letters, when a Jewish child learns his 22 letters of his alphabet, it's customary for them to write all the letters in honey on a piece of matzah, and then they eat it. And it's symbolic of ingesting his beautiful words forever.
And so in class, I always have plates with toothpicks and a piece of matzah. And the last day of class, I read each letter uh, in Hebrew and then show you how Jesus fulfilled everything that these letters mean. For example, Aleph, strength. He's the one I follow. Bet, I'm forever in his house. Gimel, he's the one that satisfies me and sustains me. Dalit, he is the door that opened the way for me. Gimel, Dalit, hey, he brings me revelation. Um, Lamed, he's my shepherd. Mem, he shed his blood and poured out living water. Uh, so all the ancient symbols are a way for me to go through the Aleph Bet, all 22 letters, and just write it down. Now, I wrote it in a uh, paper all of that that I normally read while everybody's writing their letters so I'm going to send it to you this week in um, my email and if you want to do this on your own it might be fun get a piece of matzah and some honey and a, a toothpick write all your letters and then put alongside the teaching that I'll send and you can just say it yourself and have a little holy moment yourself with the Lord so I think that's really sweet and precious that they do that. It, it's so important in that culture to teach their children from the time they're little. Using the Leviticus book as their very first book? Are you kidding me? It's the one we all want to skip over. Oh my goodness. I want to show you some fun words that share similar uh, letters and show you how you'll see this when you start studying Hebrew. Look at the word lach, which means go. When you put the letter shin on, it symbolizes the one who goes. And so you put them together, shalach, it means apostle. Shalachim are apostles. So when Jesus says go, you have to think of yourself, oh, I'm the one who's supposed to go. I'm an apostle. Look at if you add a noon on the word shalach, you get the word shulchan, which is a table. You set out a table, just like you would set out on your way to go somewhere. You're sent out for something. When it says, he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies, you can think of, oh, that table has to do with being sent out like setting out a table before my enemies. That's how I connect those two words. I go, he sets me out before my enemies. That's the same word for go, shalach, a sent out one. And right away, my mind went to Psalm 23 there. I also think of the table of his presence is where he sends us out to bring his presence wherever I go. Look at some other words that share this same two letters, to go, lach. Lechem, to go out, fight, bread, lechem. Look at the word for salt. You simply take this letter, put it on the front, and you get the word malach, which means to penetrate. Oh my goodness. So if we go out as shalachim, we're going to penetrate the world, and it's going to be a battle. The word milchama is battle. And you see the word lechem in there. You see the word salt. You see the word war. I mean, it's, isn't it fascinating? These all share these letters. Apostle. Look what else shares that letter. Forgiveness. You add a samik on the front, and you get to forgive. Salach. In the Lord's Prayer, it says, Usalachlanu et ashmetenu, usalach, forgive us our debts. Usalach lenu, forgive us our debts. And then the word shalchan, to set out a table. The, the, this is what I put in one of my books, is just how these words are all connected. Look at also this table, presence. Do you know that every piece of wood in the temple was made from a acacia tree? The table of his presence, everything wooden came in the temple from the acacia tree. Did you know it was the tree of thorns? 
And when they made his thorns, Jesus thorns, it came from the same tree. <sighs> That's to me, unbelievable that his crown came from that word, acacia. And it's connected to uh, the table of his presence. Look at this word, Natan. This is another fun word. Natan with the Tav means to give. Look at it shares its uh, two letters with the word for bridegroom, Chetan. A bride is given away to the bridegroom to give. Bridegroom. And look, it's the word for gift. Matan is to give a gift. Matan. See, they're all connected. And what did God give us? For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, who's our bridegroom, as a gift. And they share two of the same letters, all of them. Can you see that? Okay, quick fun story. The day I learned the word matan, I was at the gym and I had just learned this word matan. And I looked to my left and there was a guy with Hebrew letters. He had a big tank top and big deltoids and he had matan in Hebrew on his deltoid. And I thought, why does he have that? So I followed him downstairs at 24 hour fitness. I go, excuse me. I tap on him. He takes off his headphones. I go, you have Matan. I just learned that word this morning. You have that on your shoulder. Why? He said, I'm glad you asked. He said, I was in Afghanistan as a Marine and my best buddy, his name was Matan and he was killed in battle. So I tattooed his name on my shoulder. And it was this word right here, Matan. And, I thought, and then I, I went on to share with him more. And again, the Lord used this word that day to go and connect with somebody. And uh, yeah, it just never quits. So I'm going to end with a little practice with all of you. Why don't you all unmute yourself and let's read these real names in Hebrew. Okay, everybody unmuted. Okay. Now, for those of you who are new, we'll let you answer first. Can anybody, <laughs> can anybody tell me whose name this is? What's this letter? And none. Okay, and what's this vowel? No. no. And what's this? Noah. 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 Very good. Who said that? It's I said it. Good. <laughs> Nancy, whoever said it? No. Ah. Noah. Very good. How about this one? Here's our letter. What? Women are always right. So this is she. <laughs> S H, and it's got the E yeah. under it. Shem, 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 Shem. Shem. This is this is Shem in Hebrew. Okay, what's this letter? Het. Het. Remember, it has no hole. It's not a hey because hey has a hole. This is the harder sound. So it's. Ham or oh. Ham, Noah's son Ham. How about this one? Yod. What's this letter? Yod. Yod. What vowel Yod. is this? Dot on Yod. top is Yod. the O. 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 What is this? S. S. Samic. So it's S. And what's the vowel? Um, yeah. Eh, so it's the E vowel. And what's this letter? It's a Sophie. Cool. No, Sophie. Okay. It's, it's the pay Sophie as a fe. Okay, so let's say it together. Yo, Seth. 
Joseph. Joseph is Joseph. Look at you all read Hebrew. <laughs> Look at Nancy Hood, so proud of herself. I see you smiling. That's so fun. Okay, how about this one? Them. Mo. Mo. It's a, it's, she's always right. So this is a sh. Moshe. 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 Remember, this is the E as in they. So this is silent. It's just really a placeholder here. Moshe. So this is Moses' name in Hebrew. Moshe. Okay. Let's, let's look at this one. Is it a sin or a shin? Shin. Shin. Okay, and what's this vowel? Okay. And this is silent until you put a vowel with it. What vowel is this? Oh. It's the U, because remember, he's punched in the stomach and he goes, ooh. <laughs> and this is what letter? Lamed. So let's say it together. Sha. That's, that's Paul. Shaul is Paul or Saul. Paul. Saul. So Shaul is Paul's name in Hebrew or Saul. Okay. Now this is the last one. What's this vowel point down here? Oh. It's an S. Oh. Sheva. Remember? Yeah. Sheva. And this is a shin. Ahmed. Dot on top vowel. So it's O. So it's Sha. Lo. What's this letter? Ma. M. Mem. Mem. And what's this vowel? O. Dot on top is O. O. This is silent. This, this is a silent. A. So, mo. Shlomo is Solomon in Hebrew. Solomon. So, Shlomo is Solomon. So you'll meet Jewish people named Shlomo, and you say, oh, Solomon. I met a little bagger uh, at Stater Brothers, and I said, what's your name? And he said, my name is Ben. And I go, oh, Benjamin. And I said, are you Jewish? He said, yes. How'd you know? And I, you know, blah, 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 blah. So anyway, as, you, as you're learning names too, it also connects you with people. So that was our practice. I wanted to show you how far you've come in just six weeks. And I'm gonna uh, go, go through this one quickly. Ra, Chel, Rachel. Rachel, Rachel. Yitz, Chach. Yitzhak. Yitzhak is Isaac. Yitzhak. Yitzhak. Yaakov. Yaakov. Jacob. Jacob. And Da Vid. David. David. Rachel, Yitzhak, Yaakov, and David. All right, now what do we do? We're all done with Hebrew class. Here's my suggestion. First, if you want to get a really good foundation of Hebrew uh, vocabulary, may I suggest you begin, and it may take you years to go through this. It doesn't <laughs> matter. Think about where you want to be 10 years from now in studying Hebrew. I'm going to show you this book. And it's called the First Hebrew Primer. And here's what it looks like right here. You can order this on Amazon. And what's fun is it, it has an answer book. So when you do That's lesson nice. one, you can do it your very best and then go to your answer book and look up all your answers and say, oh my gosh, look, you know, in one month I finished uh, one chapter. I think there's like 28 chapters. But, you know, if it takes you two, three years, who cares? You know, you just start crawling through it. And that's what I decided when I began this. I said, I don't care how long it takes me. I'm going to crawl through this book if I have to do it over and over. And um, so that's one Rebecca. thing you can do. Yes. Rebecca. 
Yes. On, on that for on that first primer, definitely get the audio from the company. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Just thank to you. Go through that. Thank you, Judith. Judith is going through that as well, and I know a few others are in my class. It comes with an audio, and it also comes with thirty-five, uh, a whole uh, bunch of uh, cards, so that you can learn your all your verbs. So when I finished this class, I had three hundred and sixty-five words that I knew just like that, really, really quick. And um, so for me, this is how I built my foundation of understanding words, which opened up a whole door for me in my study. So this would be a fun thing to do. This is uh, also over here, the uh, biblical Hebrew for uh, homeschoolers. It's uh, also fairly easy, but I didn't like this because it didn't give me the solid foundational vocabulary. Um, you can learn your letters and, and a little bit of how to read Hebrew, but this one really does nail down how the language works and gives you a really good foundation for your um, Hebrew. This is a complete Jewish study Bible. I love that Bible. Um, I wanted to show you one of the pages in it. Here's what it looks like. The book of uh, Isaiah, Yeshyahu. Yesha meaning to save, Yahu means God saves, um, the Lord saves, uh, and it gives you an introduction here, it outlines it, it gives you all the book in Hebrew, it uses all your Hebrew letters, so then I go to my blue letter Bible, and I say, oh, I want to look that up there, and I may go and say, um, oh, look, immoral children have abandoned, I wonder what the word abandon is in Hebrew. So I go to Blue Letter Bible, I look up this scripture, Isaiah 1, 4, I find that word, and suddenly it's given me this all new meaning, and it expands it, it gives me other places in the scripture where I can find that ex exact same word for abandoned. And before you know it, you're three hours in your Bible, and it, it's gone so fast. You're like, oh my gosh, I've been in here for three hours. But it's easy to do when you have a good study Bible like this, and you already know some of your Hebrew letters, and you know how to look up your words. It really is fun. Um, I already said look up your words and your verbs. Uh, go through each of these handouts of your 22 letters. Uh, maybe put them in the back of your Bible, which I've suggested. Invest in this book, the Etymological Dictionary. And may I suggest also that you put little tabs in here and it'll help you look up your words as you start studying your Bible using your Hebrew. Um, Here's also one of the pages. I opened it up, just took a picture of it. I put tabs in here and uh, it gives you all this wonderful Jewish history almost on every page. Look at Avram went to Egypt and they use words like Mitzrayim and he's like, oh, I know what Mitzrayim is, that's Egypt. I learned that in my Hebrew study Bible. So you're learning vocabulary as you're also looking up uh, a lot of Hebrew culture in this uh, wonderful Bible. Um, so I am going to uh, end with a story, but I also wanted to say that I might be teaching an evangelism class over the summer. Oh. Um, a few people have said to me, you know, I love to share my faith, Rebecca, but I really don't even know where to start. I, I stumble and mumble, and um, I wish I had a, a, a complete uh, way to share the gospel. And there's lots of ways out there. Um, I don't have a, a corner on that. And let me just say, you don't need to sit down and do this big, long presentation. But what I do in my class that's a little different, and I'm going to share my screen to show you this, is over time I developed this. Uh, whoops, that wasn't right. Hold me. Let's see. Uh, 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 wait. Let me stop and get out of here and go back and 
share that. Hmm. Betsy, do you need to help me? For some reason, it's not allowing me to pull that up. Oh, I know. <laughs> Let's see. Um, I wanted to show you guys this. Well, it's not allowing me for some reason, but uh, I'll try to send it to you when I send my email out. It's, it's telling the gospel story uh, in um, a picture, and I draw it for people, and I start from the beginning in the book uh, of Genesis, and I tell a story, and I tell it in five sections, and in the story, um, I start with the Garden of Eden, because if anywhere in the gospel story they're missing part of the story, then by the time you get to the part that says you need Jesus, they'll come back with things like, well, I'm spiritual already. Because you failed to show them how they lost the spirit in the garden. And so if you can tell the story from beginning to end without leaving anything out, by the time you get to the part with them where you say, does this make sense? Is there any reason why you wouldn't want this kind of faith, they can't come up with the reason because you've explained it thoroughly and they see themselves as standing before God now as a sinner. If you don't tell the story correctly, many times they'll come back with misunderstandings, misinterpretations. Um, so to me, I, when I was trying to learn how to share my faith, I was missing parts of the gospel and I thought, okay, I'm going to figure out a way for me to share this from beginning to end so I don't leave anything out. And I started sharing the gospel that way with people. And by the time I was done, I was finding many more people came to Christ when I drew that picture and explained it in its fullness. And then at the end of it, they would always say, can I have that piece of paper? I want that. Can I want to put it in my Bible forever. And I said, well, here, let's put your date on it that you accepted Christ. And then we write it on there. Well, what I did was I designed a, a, a birth certificate with the story already on it so that you can print it out and, and show them the story. And then when they receive Christ, it's got a place on there for put for them to put their name in the book of life on the certificate mm. and date it. Now I ran into mm. one of my patients who was a UPS driver mm. and he said to me, Oh, I led him to the Lord in the gym after a cardiac rehab session. And he said, I still have that picture you drew for me in my Bible. Mm. So, uh, that's how I teach it because it works good for me that way. And if anybody's interested in taking a six week class and learning how to draw that out, um, I, it depends on how much interest there is. I'm going to throw out an email to the tour group and to, um, others and just see if there's an interest. Um, I wanted to show you something fun. Speaking of e evangelism. I have in my house this mosaic I did over the arch going into my kitchen. And when I did it, I thought I need a way to bring evangelism into this. So what I did was I put something in the top. So when people came into my home to do repairs, I would tell them, well, I'm not sure you're smart enough to repair my dishwasher. And he'd say, excuse me? And I said, well, you have to come over here and you have to stand and you have to look up. And if you can't find the word up there, then I don't know that I can trust you to fix my dishwasher. So here's a guy who was standing under there and I snapped his picture when he was looking for the word in my arch. And this is the word here. So in red, I put Jesus in red mm -hmm. stones. We can't sometimes, see you see it in red? No, we can't see that. Oh, you what can't. What you're see talking it? about. No. Oh. You're showing spiritual birth certificate on the screen. Oh, it finally came up? Okay, so. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so hold on. Let me go. Let, let me go back. Let me go back. Can you see that now? 
Yes, yes. Now we can see it. Now we can see it, yes. All right, here's yes, the so arch. Cool. Here's yeah, the arch. It took pretty. five days to put all this up here. Here's, wow. here's the guy standing there uh -huh. trying to figure out what was up there. Some mm -hmm. people see it right away. Some can't see it at all. <laughs> now, can you see it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. See it? It says Jesus. Mm -hmm. Well, this opens many conversations. Um, just having this as a fun thing to do when people come into my house, now I make them stand under here and, <laughs> and I just go, Lord, give me an opportunity to witness to them. I led three different people to the Lord just having that little arch thing in my house mm -hmm. and finding a way to open up a spiritual conversation. And that's one of the things I teach in my Hebrew cl uh, evangelism class is creative ways to make a bridge to begin a spiritual conversation and, and ways to begin a spiritual conversation. And then once the conversation has begun, then you can say to them something very simple like, you know, someone drew me a picture once that really helped me understand the whole gospel message. Would you mind if I drew it for you? And I've never had anyone say no. So I'll grab a napkin, I'll grab a piece of paper. I did it for a woman next to me on a plane in Dallas. We got off, I invited her for lunch. I drew her that picture at lunch. She said, oh my gosh, can I have this? I'm gonna take it home and put it in my Bible. But anyway, I share that just so that you'll have some idea why I teach it the way I teach it and how fun it is to um, find creative ways to start spiritual conversations. And then once they're started, then I have, have a plan where you can sit down and actually explain the gospel from beginning to end. Now I wanna end with a fun story and I'm gonna go back to my screen for a minute and we're almost done. So here's the story. When I started learning Hebrew, which is what all of you are doing right now, somebody in my church knew that I was all about studying Hebrew. So she lived in a um, mobile home park and this little elderly woman lived next door who was Jewish. And she said, she's the most lovely educated woman and she loves to read. I know. I'll have you over for coffee and I'll invite B over. And, you know, she can just meet you and you can form a relationship with her and just see what the Lord does. I go, oh, that'd be great. So I went over to her trailer and she invited B over. We had tea and we chit chatted and stuff. And she says, oh, I love to read. I said, do you? I said, well, you know, I'm learning Hebrew. She said, why would you do that? I said, well, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so now I've got her interest and I'm saying, I have a bunch of books that you might be interested in. She goes, oh, I love to read. Just br bring them, I'll invite you over to my house. So I got her phone number. She invited me over. I started giving her books one after another. I'd come back the next week and she'd say, I'd say, did you read it? And she said, oh, I read the whole thing. N now what do you have? Well, after about 10 books, and these were all <laughs> Messianic books about Jesus, every single one of them, she said to her neighbor, I want to know Jesus. Do you think you could invite Rebecca over and we could all pray together? And I'm like, oh my goodness, this is amazing, Lord. So I go over to her trailer park and B comes over and I drew her that picture from beginning to end. At the end, I said, is there any reason why you wouldn't want this be? And she says, no, let's do it right now. And I said, okay. So she prayed to receive Christ that day. We put her name and the date on the piece of paper. So fast forward, I get a phone call from B. Now I'm gonna go back and share my screen because I wanted to show you this picture. She said to me, my grandson, is a Messianic Jew up in Los Angeles. And he and his family had been praying for me all their lives that I would come to know Jesus. And they wanna drive down and we want you to baptize me so that my son and his family 
can see that I'm making a public display of my faith. So he drove down with his wife and five children. And this is B. She's 90 some years old. And we baptized her in the name of Jesus. And um, it was such a glorious day. It was so fabulous. And here we are at the end in the picture. And look how happy he is. And look how beautiful she is. Isn't she dear? That's the story of somebody that just said, hey, I know somebody who's interested in Hebrew. Maybe I should get them together with somebody else. So I told this story today as, it, as we end, not so that you can think anything great of me, but that so now you can see yourself sometime perhaps down the road. You don't know how God is. I, I had no idea that was going to happen to me. But somebody knew that I was interested in Hebrew and connected the two of us. And look, that was an answer to her grandson's prayer. And it happened. she died the next year, by the way. So talk about beautiful timing, right? Mm -hmm. So that is the end of our class. That's the end of um, my story. And let's unmute and see if there's any questions, comments. Um, and we'll just... <laughs> End on prayer. Did everybody unmute themselves? I think so. I think so. Yeah. Well, it was a wonderful class. It's always good yes. to learn more things. I know you're learning, Eloise, and you're faithful to come uh, to Torah and continue to learn. But it's, it just seems exciting to me. I don't know why. I, and my friends say, well, what are you doing this for? And I'm going, <laughs> it's just so fun. It's exciting. You know, I, I love it. I'm, they're, they're kind of, you know, and, and Judy Kerr's down here is the one that got me going with you. So this is Judy I'm, here. This is Judy yeah. here. Say hi, Judy. Hi. So just tell somebody, so tell somebody like Judy told me. And, tell you know, somebody. Yes. On. And Judy, who told you? Um, Amy Miller and um, oh, the one who used to teach at CBS. Exactly, she was the leader of CBS. She came to my talk. Then she told Amy. Amy told Judy, and Judy told Eloise. So see, each person is being a spark, and that. And Amy, Amy, and Judy both told me. Also, that's why I'm here. Well, there you go. <laughs> see. It's just tag, you're it. Boom. You're a spark. <laughs> now Nancy you told, told somebody. And somebody Nancy else. Nancy told me. And, and Nancy told you. Okay. <laughs> so there you go. Bunch of sparks. Yeah. yeah. And one of your words today really spoke to me. Um, the, the word, um, where did it go? Um, to hear and obey. Uh, Shema? Or Shema? Yeah. Shema. Yeah. Shema because um, I'm doing a Bible study just that one of my friends in New York and I are doing a Bible study on hearing God's voice. And mm -hmm. that was one of the things was you have to hear and obey. And mm -hmm. so I think that word is just perfect for what we're trying to do. There <laughs> so you go. Share that with her yeah. today. <laughs> Isn't that good? Yeah, really good. It's fun to think of all the ways of how God might use each of us uh, in his kingdom in these last days. And you know, I don't know what it's going to look like for each of you, but um, we all have our own journey and it'll be our own experience and blessings. And um, my prayer is that in some small way, <laughs> he uses each of you. Well, you have, you are doing so much, I think, for all of us to be able to do that. And I am looking forward to doing your evangelical classes, mm -hmm. if you do it, so... Okay, you can well, put me as your first sign up. <laughs> first sign up. All right. All right. Rebecca, I have to tell you, my husband has been walking through, you know, while you're teaching, and he just said, She's a really good teacher, isn't she? <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, you know, Rebecca, I think by the, by the fact that you're um, video, you know, capturing these all on video, both this and the Torah class, I think it's really going to expand your ministry because. Yeah. You, know, you can tell people, well, check in here, yeah. you know, re look at this video. <laughs> and I and I think even you should continue. 
I said this in an email, but I hope you continue yes. doing a video so that it can be captured and, and watched by many more people that can come to the can come to the class. And wouldn't, yeah. and wouldn't you wouldn't you all love to see Harvey do some teaching on here? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh -huh. I watched it, Harvey's video that you have on YouTube with your stuff. I watched yes. that yesterday. It's, wasn't and it I really fantastic? enjoyed that. Yeah. See? Yeah. So. All right. <laughs> Harvey, I'm not I'm not asking you to commit to anything, but um, <laughs> this would be a great, great place to tag team on here. Yeah. So any other comments before we just end today? No, just a big thank you. Yes. 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 Thank, thank you. you so much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it. Well, keep keep practicing your letters and um, I hope you'll continue on your own. And I'm going to be sending you this recording today as well as the PowerPoint. And then I'll send you also all the letters so that perhaps you can write your alphabet on matzah with honey. Okay. Oh, very good. Yeah. So let's pray. Mm. Harvey, would you pray for us before we leave? Sure. Father, thank you uh, for Rebecca, for the great gifts that you've given to her, her ability to uh, bring us so clearly uh, the, the things of your kingdom. Uh, Father, we... Uh, Pray that everyone in this class be blessed with the knowledge of Hebrew, that they use it for your glory, that they use it to further your kingdom and to bring even more people to know Yeshua HaMashiach. And just to be blessed by the knowledge of what he has done for us and to bring him uh, to a dying world, uh, that they would also be blessed uh, by the good news of Yeshua. And it's B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, team. Well, until next time, God be with you. Yebarechecha Adonai ve'yishmerecha. Yisa Adonai panavalecha ve'yuhunecha. May the Lord bless you, Thank you Rebecca. Bless you. So All right. Take care. Ten years from now. Bye.